time, you have no idea, right, that you know, I'm going to grow up to become a nun. But, but I think that now that I look back, I'm like, I don't think it's any, any coincidence that I, I was born in a house that where you, know, you could walk five minutes and be with nuns. <laughs> they were Catholic nuns, but they were nuns. And I had very fond memories of them. And uh, when I was going, uh, growing up, we would go and visit Thailand once or twice a year. And my mother would bring us to the monastery maybe once or twice a year. <laughs> so for me, it was very special to go to the monastery. It wasn't like if I had grown up in Thailand and was dragged you know, out of bed to offer dana early in the morning every day, I might, I might be a little more <laughs> mixed in my opinions. But for me, it was like, oh, wow. You know, going to the monastery is a special thing. And I, I remember seeing, actually, um, a nun when I was, I don't know, seven or eight. I can't really quite remember what age I was. Uh, at the time in Thailand, they didn't have bikuni, so she was a machi, so a white-robed, eight-precept nun, sort of sitting, sitting there quietly teaching. And I remember thinking, oh, that seems like a good life. So I think, I think these things, when I look back, you know, there, there are no, no coincidence. But when you're just a kid going to school, I mean, what do you know about, you know, people ask, you, what you want to be when you grow up, people say, oh, I want to be a teacher, I want to be a doctor, I want to be, you know, no one says I want to be a nun. So there's, there's not quite that in your head. But nonetheless, I think a natural affinity for the Dhamma um, developed as I grew up. So even when I, I went to school uh, in the Philippines until high school, and then after that, I went to do my undergraduate degree in America. And so I went to Harvard, which is, uh, you know, supposed to be a good university. <laughs> but I, I also felt quite, uh, quite unhappy, actually, when I was a student there. Uh, it was very stressful because, because, really, you're always looking for your worth from the outside. So there, there's very much an, influ you know, an emphasis on, on having achievements that you can, you can show, you know, <laughs> things like I, you know, I, I, I attained these grades, I got this kind of scholarship, I, I got this job at this prestigious company, you know, I applied to this graduate school and I got in. It was very much always talk about what you accomplished uh, that, was, that was worldly. And I think that deep down, I, I actually didn't really share those values, but when you're, when you're living surrounded by that kind of mentality, you can't help but just absorb it. And you, so you think that you always have to prove yourself according to what it is other people value. And I think deep down, I probably felt quite conflicted about this. And so, so yeah, I was quite unhappy. <laughs> I remember my second year, I was, I was uh, actually seriously depressed. And at that point, you know, Rather than go out and just get drunk or whatever, you know, luckily, luckily I had some grounding in the Dhamma. And so, so my mother's advice, you know, was go to the monastery, <laughs> go speak to the monk. And I was like, okay, okay, that sounds good. You know, that sounds like a good idea. So I remember I got this book from this friendly monk in this, uh, yeah, Thai, Thai temple in LA. I had to go all the way across the country you know, to go to a Buddhist monastery. <laughs> But, um, but there I got this book that, that was uh, translated from a Thai, Thai, very famous Thai monk uh, named Buddhadasa Bhikkhu. And it was sort of an introduction to Buddhism. And I remember reading that, sort of looking for answers, looking for why, why am I so unhappy and how do I stop being so unhappy? And there was a line that really resonated with me in there, which is that of all the things the Buddha taught, he taught about suffering and the end of suffering. I mean, that's really it. And to me, I thought, yeah, well, that's all that matters. <laughs> you know, when, when, you're, when you're actually really suffering, you don't really care about all those other things that are supposedly called success, all those other things that are supposedly supposed to give you happiness. Because I found it didn't. You know, you accomplish one thing, then you just expect to accomplish another thing. <laughs> you, know, you, you scale one mountain, then you have to look at the next, and it's endless. But here was the promise of an end of suffering. And that was very interesting. I mean, I, to me, I felt, OK, well, this is it. This is the real meaning of life. And this is really what's worth pursuing in one's life. And I think at that, at that time, even though I was very, you know, quite young, probably 19, I, I really found, I found my, my, my compass in life. I found, I found the direction 
and the highest purpose and goal of my life, what it would be. And that was such a relief because when you're, when you're young, you're just lost, right? You don't really know what you want to do, what you want to become, that kind of thing. But at least I knew at some level, this was the most important thing I had to do in my life. So whether I did it exactly then or not was another story. Because when you're young, you, you don't really have um, any role models, especially spiritual role models for women. Maybe if I was a man in Thailand or something and I came to this, this conclusion, I'd be like, oh, right, off to the monastery I go and I shall ordain as a bhikkhu kind of thing. But when you're, when you're a woman, you're just kind of like, well, okay, so I know the Dhamma is important, but how does that actualize in my life? I wasn't, you know, I didn't really know. So I just did the normal thing and I, you know, finished school, got a job. And, uh, and I, remember, I remember thinking that it seemed, it seemed that if I wanted to devote myself to the Dhamma, it would be like very serious. <laughs> You know, I had, to be, I had to be serious about it. And I was like, I'm young, I just want to have fun first. So my mentality was, well, let me have fun, you know, for a while. And, you know, and later on, I'll be, you know, devoted to the Dhamma. So, so when I was in my 20s, I, I chose to go and work in New York City because if you want, if you want a fun life, right, <laughs> you know, you, you go to New York City. And so I had my time of fun in my early 20s, just, you know, living a quite carefree life. And basically, in, in, if you want to use Buddhist vocabulary, just you know, living the world of the, of the five sense pleasures. So, so looking for your fun from the, you know, going to, going to movies, going to shows, you know, going to restaurants, eating food, this, that, having fun with friends, basically five sense pleasures. And I had that for a while. And really, after the second year, I was already a bit bored of it. I mean, it's, it's fun for a while, and then it's just that. Then you get bored, and then, then what? And so again, I, I began to look again to the Dhamma, because I felt that, that that would provide something more satisfying. And so I started to practice meditation more seriously, and I started to devote time to, to doing spiritual things and not just you know, worldly pursuits. But really what, what turned me more seriously towards the thought of ordaining or that kind of thing was when I was 25 and I, I came back to Thailand and my mother became very ill in a way that was very sudden. And also, it was, a very, um, it was a very rare illness that was said to be terminal, but you also didn't know when. So originally, she was, she was given six months, and we were thinking, oh my goodness, you know, suddenly you start preparing for like death, you know, you know right, right in your face. But it was very unpredictable, and she actually lived on another five years, but constantly with, with our thought of, well, we don't know when it's going to happen. So for me, that, that really brought home the point that life is really uncertain. And this plan of my having fun first and then devoting myself to the Dhamma later became quite, it seemed, well, you know, I've had enough fun. <laughs> how much later am I going to have? You know, my mother's not that old. So, I mean, when's my, when's, when's my time going to be up? So that made me much more, much more focused. And, uh, and so then I began to practice the Dhamma more seriously. And I started to think about ordaining because I thought, well, if this is the most important thing to do in life, you know, why not be professional? <laughs> you know, why not be full time? Because that would really be the easiest way to learn something, right? And I mean, if you want to, if you want to be a student, you know, it's easier to be a full time student and not like part time and you know holding on a job at the same time kind of thing. Similarly, if you want to, if you really want to, you know, figure out stuff in terms of the dhamma, learn it, study it, practice it wholeheartedly. I thought, well, heck, full time. So then I thought, you know, being a monastic would be would be really a good option, or maybe the, the, the most conducive way to do that. But again, as a woman, you think, but what are the monastic options for a woman? You know, so it was, it was more confusing and hazy. I didn't really have a clear idea of where I could go or what, you know, what, what would be a suitable, suitable option. So it was more just an idea for a long time, maybe five years that, that uh, also my, I was, I felt I couldn't go as long as my mother was still alive. You know, I'd have to see that through first. But also because I was, I was still not sure myself whether I was more in love with the idea of being a monastic than really, really actually knowing what it entailed. So I, I was worried that I would have just romanticized notions of what being a nun was or, you know, what the nun's life was. And maybe it was just a form of escape. So I had my five years of grappling with it <laughs> and really uh, looking into the, into the Dhamma more. So studying it and practicing it, 
I did a master's degree um, partly, <laughs> partly just to have time to read more about Buddhism and to, to practice and write a thesis about it to see whether or not I, I love the Dhamma enough to devote my whole life to it, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, and then the more, I must, the more I studied, the more I practiced, the more I wanted to devote more time to it, the more it seemed like the most important thing to do. And so, so it was quite natural, my progression to becoming monastic. You know, it was just getting myself, you know, walking from the shallow end and just, you know, progressing until you get wetter and wetter. And so, so after I finished my master's degree, I, I wanted to just explore monastic life more. And one, one turning point was coming here, actually. So back in 2008, um, I spent a few weeks at Bodhinyana, and I spent, a few, I think, a month and a half at Damasara because I'd never lived in a nun's community. I'd visited monasteries in Thailand before, but they were monks' monasteries. So when you go as a laywoman, it's, it's still not a clear idea of what it would be like to be one of them, because you're not one of them, you know? But when I came here, I had more of a sense of what it would be like to be one of them. Because when you're a laywoman staying here, you're a bit more involved, you have a bit more contact with the monastics. And I remember thinking, I'm so relieved that I actually think I would like it. <laughs> You know, I had this idea of, oh, I want to be a nun. And you, what if you went to a nunnery and you're like, oh, God, I hate it. So I was actually so relieved after that experience. And, no, no, I think I, 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 think I, I actually really like it. I really, I really uh, you know, really took to monastic life. I really felt it, uh, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, a duck going back into water kind of thing. You, know, you just take to it. And so that helped me clarify that actually this, this kind of lifestyle is not escapism. You know, I thought, oh, maybe I'm just really tired of the humdrum of daily life, you know, paying the bills, going to work, that kind of thing. But then I came to the monastery and they had these eternal discussions about their phone bills and, you know, their water pump and, you know, <laughs> all this kind of stuff. It's like, oh, yeah, no, real life exists in the monastery, too. And, you know, I'm not running away from anything. In fact, maybe there's more here because there's, you know, in your little house, you have just your stuff. But this is like much, much more responsibility. So... So I thought, well, great, I'm not running away, and I'm running to something I actually think would be enjoyable and helpful in my practice. And so, so then I decided, okay, I want to be a nun. And uh, that basically, I think for me, being able to be in a, a suitable environment, a, a conducive environment, to help one to, to grow in the Dhamma is very important. And I think monastic life provides that. It provides that. Uh, that training and it provides the environment and it provides a lifestyle that's simple and a lifestyle that is centered on, you know, virtuous conduct. And so it's uh, something that I found very difficult when I was a lay person trying to practice. It, I felt I was always pulled in different directions. You know, on the one hand, you go and you listen to a Dhamma talk and then immediately you come out and you're like in the middle of busy Bangkok with all these advertising, you know, blaring in your face. And you're like, oh, wait, okay, no desires, right? And so it's, uh, it's very conflicted. Or maybe the people around you, your friends, your family, not everybody is going to be so interested in Dhamma. So it can be a bit, you know, you can't quite communicate or you can't find people who are also doing the same thing. But in the monastery, everyone's, we're going for the same thing, you know, and... Uh, and it's a very helpful and supportive uh, to have that community feeling. Well, I think that you know a good a good way to think of the Buddhist path um, is the the three the three modules of conduct, so virtuous conduct, and then the second is the training of the mind, and the third is to develop wisdom to understand the way things really are. So if we can begin to practice elements of these three aspects of the path, so by leading a life that doesn't cause harm to oneself or other, you know, not virtuous in this goody-goody two-shoes kind of way, but virtuous in that sense of being harmless, really recognizing when our actions cause harm. And what's interesting is harm not just to others, but to ourselves as well. So if we are just guided by this very basic principle, you know, whether you can memorize the five precepts or not, whether you can keep them perfectly or not, if we're always, uh, you know, our intention is always inclined towards refraining from harming, I think that in itself will bring you such an improvement in your quality of life. 
Now, without having to be a so-called religious person or a Buddhist, even that, just, just being constantly mindful of what, what is harmful. And that actually requires the other two aspects because we can't know what's harmful or not if our mind has no, has no clarity. So we need to develop a, a level of mindfulness, which is the buzzword now, you know, mindfulness. Um, but what that really means is really being there in the present, being here in the present, and knowing what's happening. Because we can't know what's appropriate to do unless we're actually here, you know? And so being able to, to keep our harmless conduct, we need to have some level of mental training where we can be here in the now so we can know what's appropriate to do in the now. So meditation is something that is now introduced even to school children because, because it's recognized what a benefit it brings to one's life. When our mind is all over the place, we have abs- we're completely you know, at the, at, the, at the beck and call of our anger, you know, our fear, our worries, all sorts of distressing emotions that if we've never trained our mind, there's no way we can actually be free of these things. But if we start to train our mind, you know, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, eventually we'll build up more clarity and more presence. So that's something that is relevant to anybody. And then finally, the wisdom to, to know things as they really are. This, this is almost like a Buddhist cliche, which can sound so obscure. It's like, know what? <laughs> and how is it really? But, but really, I mean, if you, just, if you just break it down to something so simple as, as if you're having a conflict with someone, okay, someone in your life, you know, in your family, in your workplace, whatever, has just, has just had an angry outburst and called you bad names or that kind of thing. So how much wisdom we have will depend, you know, how much wisdom we have will determine how deeply we see into the situation. If we just see that, oh, this, this person is so bad, this person is so wrong, they've just, they've just you know, yelled my head off, then we're only seeing things like at a certain surface level. But if we look deeper into, into how that might have been caused, you know, what suffering that person might be feeling, that has led to this, what kind of conditions has made this person have to act in this way, we start to see things more, more deeply and more according to reality. So when we can see things more according to reality, we find we can accept it more, right? So if we just, if we just think, oh, this person just, you know, just totally out of line, then we can't accept it. But if we see that, oh, you know, this person, you know, they've always had a temper, they have, they have a problem with their temper, or they have a lot of suffering right now, they're very stressed out with whatever problems they have in their life. If we can see more what are the causes and conditions behind things, we find it more easy to let go. And so this is something that you can see in your own life, how when we see things as they really are, it causes us to be able to release our suffering, you know, lighten things up a little. And so that, I think, is how Buddhism can serve the community or any, any human, really. It's because it allows us to touch into a, a deeper source of happiness.